Hello and welcome to Yesteryear's Max, a series that usually looks at games available for old Macintosh systems, but today we'll be focusing on one of the machines that play them. So the subject of interest today will be the Mac that I feel is one of the best all-rounders. The last of the PowerBook G3s, codenamed during development and now referred to online as the Pismo, named after a beach in California. Although the Mac itself probably wouldn't like the sand, it's coarse, rough and irritating, and gets everywhere. The PowerBook G3 managed to retain relatively sensible aesthetics in Apple's era of particularly loud design choices for all their other models. Nevertheless, it's still a sleek looking machine, albeit quite chunky by today's standards. The design originated from the Wall Street and Main Street models of 1998. Small improvements were made in the weight department between this and February of 2000 when the Pismo hit the market. It's perceivably lighter and as an estimate, about 30% thinner. The key reasons I feel make this computer a superb Mac to pick up for active use include its portability in comparison to a desktop. It doesn't take up too much space when it's not in use. It's semi-modern ports, which make transferring files and games very easy. It's repair and expandability. Opening it up to access internals is simple. Yeah, that was a thing on Macs once. Finally, it's 4 or 500 megahertz PowerPC G3 chip, which is more than powerful enough to tackle anything that the classic Mac OS can throw at it. It runs early OS X nicely too. Compatibility with games is about as wide as it gets with old Macs. It runs most things made for System 7 very nicely, and some even earlier stuff that was well made. As games became more complex in the mid 2000s, it was eventually left behind. But early OS X games run perfectly fine. The vast majority of gameplay for the games on my channel are captured on this very Pismo. So let's take a look at the components to find out a bit more. To crack it open, simply push two latches at the top of the Pismo's keyboard towards you and the whole thing just lifts right up. As mentioned earlier, the processor is a 400 or 500 megahertz G3. The latter isn't all that common. The CPU sits separate to the rest of the logic board and can be taken out and replaced with third-party G4 chips. The Pismo shipped with 64 or 128 megabytes of RAM. Mine's been maxed out at a gig. Hard drive options ranged from 6 to 30 gigabytes and it will support up to 128. Graphics are handled by an ATI Rage Mobility 128. This is about one of the only things you can't take out and upgrade. In addition, an internal airport wireless card can be added and a flipping brilliant idea that was sadly very much of its time and would be ditched on the Pismo's replacement are two levers that eject the battery and CD or DVD drive. They just slide right out. I can't really imagine a situation where replacing the primary battery made sense, but the second bay could be swapped out with a better optical drive that could burn discs, an iAmiga zip drive, another hard drive, a weight saving device which was just a hollow plastic case, another battery, that was popular, and in 2007, a company called FastMac even made a Blu-ray burner that was compatible with it. One peculiar quirk of the Pismo is that often it won't boot with a dead clock battery. The little socket that connects the pram can be accessed under here too and pulled out without any fuss. This issue is well known in Mac circles, but often enough, regular people selling their old equipment will have no idea. A non-booting Pismo will therefore often be listed as not working despite the only reason for not booting being this tiny issue. That doesn't mean that all Pismos listed as not working will be easily fixable like this, but I bought my second under these pretenses, figuring that it would be handy to have a parts donor for my main machine as it gets quite a lot of use. And hey, wouldn't you know it, I pulled out the pram and it booted up quite happily. I don't know if this is common, but I just thought I would mention. My main Pismo only boots after the reset button has been pressed, no idea why. It could be the lack of a working pram again, so if you have one that still isn't booting, give these quick things a shot before trying anything drastic. In most cases, the main battery is going to be as flat as a pancake as well, although mine came with a third party one, which must have been quite a recent addition to the machine. It'll do about three hours of mixed use. Port options are old enough to be outdated, but modern enough to still be easy to work with. On the Pismo then, you get two audio jacks, one for sound in, one for sound out, two USB 1.1 ports, 100 megabits per second ethernet, two Firewire 400 ports, S-Video out, 
and VGA out. The latter is one of the reasons this Mac is easy to use today, as a sizeable chunk of the desktops were either all-in-ones and had no video out, or used this, a DB15 socket that's relatively compatible with VGA, but different enough to cause headaches. There's also infrared and a PC card slot on the side. Firewire is ace, but in fairness, you'll probably be hard pressed to find all that much that puts it to any use. So it's the USB and Ethernet then, which are probably the most useful. USB 1.1 is painfully slow by today's standards, and getting files over takes a while, although not as long as it takes to decompress the apps after transfer. It is possible, however, to make use of the PC card slot with a USB 2.0 card. However, it will only run at USB 2 speeds under OS X Jaguar and above. So the best option may be to simply network the Pismo with the Ethernet port and download whatever applications or games you're after direct from a networked device or a website. It's not a particularly difficult system to get on the net. Ethernet cables just work. Wi-Fi does too, but official airport cards are incompatible with the security protocols that modern routers use. Some people get around this with a more modern Wi-Fi adapter in the PC card slot. A Pismo isn't going to blaze through today's internets. I've been on the mobile Twitter and posted messages with it before, but even with the semi-modern Classilla, which is an OS 9 browser based off the old Mozilla application suite, most sites just won't work properly. If you do decide to take it on the net, remember to change the date to something modern, as the Mac's clock battery will be dead. This saves clicking through heaps of invalid certificate messages as the wider web wonders what on earth this device is doing in 1904. For the most part then, these machines will be running off the mains like a desktop. Plugging in an external monitor, along with a USB keyboard and mouse, allows you to close the lid once it's booted and run it in clamshell. For a lot of cases, this will improve graphical performance over mirroring the screen, as doing that splits the 8 megabytes of VRAM in half as it drives both. So that's the hardware. What of the software then? Well, macOS 9 is the only version of the classic macOS that it'll run. It's too new for 8, and as far as OS X is concerned, while it will run Tiger, and people have hacked it to run Leopard as well, you'll have a better experience with Panther or Jaguar. The latter is what my Pismo dual boots into. Jaguar was the Aqua interface in full swing before it was gradually toned down in subsequent releases. In truth, if you wanted an OS X Mac, newer machines are a better choice. I would recommend the Pismo as a predominantly OS 9 Macintosh that can do a bit of OS X on the side. Now it's not particularly tricky to get a hold of one of these things. I can't speak for the US, which I know is where most of you watching are based, but here in the much smaller UK second-hand Mac environment, expect to pay around 50 to 70 quid on a fully functioning example, and more if it's been upgraded and has interesting things in the bays. There's usually one or two for sale on eBay at any one time, so they're not exactly numerous, but certainly not rare. One of the most obvious ways for identifying a Pismo over an earlier Lombard, if the eBay description is low effort, is on the bezel under the monitor. Pismos just say PowerBook, whereas Lombards say Macintosh PowerBook G3. Even earlier models will have the rainbow apple. The factory specifications are also printed on the back, which is helpful. The Pismo was top dog of the Macintosh laptops for just under a year. When 2001 rolled in, the game-changing Titanium PowerBook G4 blew everyone's minds with its incredibly sleek design. Gone was the plastic, gone were the curves. The machine was much thinner, and it gradually got a lot faster over its two years on the market. Now yes, it will run OS 9 natively, and later models scream in comparison to the Pismo, with a processor up to a whole gigahertz. But the Pismo is in my mind still the model to get as Mac OS 9 doesn't need the extra power, and the Tybook's case has aged horrendously. These are some of the most damageable and frail Macs out there, and one in good nick will command a hefty premium. The Pismos, in comparison, are probably as robust as Mac laptops get. The appeal of the Pismo to me is of a utilitarian nature. I play games and then talk about them, and sometimes fiddle around with their resources, and the Pismo just gets on with it. This isn't a Mac to just put on a shelf to look at, it's not pretty enough. If you want a prop, get an iBook. So, to summarise, this is a fine machine, and they should hold up pretty well for years to come. It is a vintage computer, so component failure isn't off the cards. But if something breaks, you can swap it out for a spare with a cross and a Torx screwdriver. 
A Pismo then is a sound investment, and in my opinion, easily one of the best Macs ever made. That's it then for this edition of Yesteryear's Macs. Corrections, opinions, other tidbits of info, and input in general are of course very much welcome. So pop your thoughts in the comments, or on the Twitter. You can find me there at YYsMG. For reviews and footage of old Mac games, check out the rest of my channel. I look at all sorts, from obscure single dev shareware titles to larger commercial releases. Subscribing will keep you on top of new content, so doing that comes highly recommended. Thanks for watching then, and see you next time.